Good afternoon. It's such an honor to join you today to speak on gender and civilian security. The topic could not be more timely. As we speak, civilians are being blown apart by U.S. drones in Pakistan and Yemen. They are being burned and gassed inside Syria. They're suffering deprivation, displacement, and disenfranchisement. They're being raped. They're burying their loved ones. They're suffering stigma from the abuse they've received. They're awaiting justice. They are everywhere speaking out, asking for the security that is their due, and more than anything, for an end to armed conflict. You know, when I first began looking at civilian protection and gender during my doctoral work with a grant from the Center for the Study of Women in Society at University of Oregon, I noticed in the law that civilians are understood as those not directly participating in hostilities, a category which includes many non-combatant men and excludes women in combat roles, but that in political speech and practice, civilians are understood as women and children with military-age men assumed to be combatants and often targeted for execution as a result. In other words, the concept of the civilian in international law is gender neutral, but the application of that concept in practice is anything but. I showed how this played out in places like Srebrenica, where the aid organizations and peacekeepers stood by as Bosnian Serbs separated women and children from men and teenage boys allowing the former to flee, before then executing their brothers, fathers, and husbands, many with their hands tied behind their backs, and all the while claiming to be complying with the civilian immunity norm. As a young scholar, I had naively hoped that clarifying the law would lead to better protection practices, to more security for civilians. Yet I have observed over the past eight years of teaching and research and writing and blogging and participant observation in the Human Security Network that not so much has changed. For example, in the so-called War on Terror, first the Bush administration and then his successor began using and now increasingly rely on signature strikes against suspected militants to disrupt terror networks. These strikes regularly sweep up civilians, including children. This strike alone in October 2006 killed 69 children, despite claims that these are precise weapons. And who are U.S. military planners targeting so precisely? How do our warfighters know high-value targets or militants when they see them? They infer militancy based on their suspicions. And in tallying collateral damage, they assume that any military-age male near a suspected militant was also a suspected militant. You know what I find most fascinating about all this? What I find most disheartening? It's not that states behave this way in carrying out and justifying their use of armed force. What fascinates me is that those civilian protection advocates who spend their time tallying the civilian dead are as often as not buying into the U.S. government framing of just who is and who isn't a civilian. Recall that in international law, where the civilian character of an individual is unknown, they shall be assumed to be a civilian. Think about what that means. In this graph, if you included military-age men whose status is unknown, not only everything in the red, but also everything in the gray should be coded as civilian. Think of that, 3,150 killed in drone strikes in Pakistan, 3,100 or 98.5% should have been shown to be civilians. And yet in this graph designed by the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, the category other is separated out from the category civilians and is included along with high-profile targets under non-civilians, following the U.S. logic precisely. While the graph is intended to invoke outrage over civilian casualties, and while it has helped to do so, it also affirms the flawed U.S. understanding of what a civilian is. And in so doing, it inflicts damage on the concept of the civilian in international law as an object of protection. What are we to make of this? My point is not, and never was, that the law on civilian immunity discriminates against men 
The point is that the civilian immunity norm is built on gender essentialisms that fail to adequately protect civilians, male and female alike, and that recognizing this, questioning this, is the first step toward building a more powerful civilian protection regime and better security for actual civilians. What does that mean, that the laws of war were built on gender essentialisms? It means that the law relies on assumptions about the innate characteristics of men and women, assumptions ill-suited to reality and therefore unsuited to effecting change in that reality. What are some of these gendered assumptions? One, as I've argued, is that civilians are synonymous with women and children, but another is that the purpose of the law is to protect the innocent and vulnerable. But as Judith Gardam and Michelle Jarvis point out in this book, the bulk of war law is actually not designed to protect civilians, many of whom are women and children, but to protect combatants, most of whom are men. The original Geneva Conventions dealt with the needs, not of civilians at all, but of sick and wounded soldiers on land and at sea, and with prisoners of war, mostly assumed to be male. The Hague Conventions protected combatants from the effects of particularly cruel weapons, expanding or exploding bullets, poison gas, later white phosphorus. But only in 1977 were civilians even defined in treaty law, and that law protects them only in very limited circumstances when compared to what civilians actually face in war. The clearest rule that civilians shall not be directly targeted is actually the thing women and children are least likely to experience in war. It is civilian men who most need protection from that. But many of the harms women and children do need protection from aren't even regulated by humanitarian law. The law doesn't cover displacement, widowhood, psychosocial trauma, the right to recover the remains of one's family members, or the stigma of wartime abuse, a trauma which bleeds over into peacetime. Perhaps most importantly, civilians are not protected against the harm that kills more women and children in war than anything else, the long-term indirect effects of lawful military operations, or what militaries euphemistically call collateral damage. Women and children may be least likely to be taken aside and shot, but they are extremely likely to be harmed incidentally by mortar fire or high explosives. Yet existing war law is not designed to protect against such harms. What we do know from history, though, is that those assumptions can change and the law can be strengthened. In the few minutes I have left, let me tell you about some political entrepreneurs who are working not only to enforce existing immunity norms, but to expand those norms progressively to reframe the way that governments think about their obligations to secure civilians. The Making Amends campaign, for example, is based on a new idea that governments must do more than not commit war crimes. They bear a responsibility to the civilians they harm through lawful combat operations. The entrepreneur behind this idea was Marla Rusica, a determined young activist who was horrified to discover that her government had no obligation to help the civilian victims it was harming in its wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, and who founded a new NGO to promote change. After Marla's death in Iraq, her torch was carried by her successors, led by Sarah Holowinski, who now lobby governments to take stock of the damage caused by drone warfare, to assist collateral damage victims, and to fully consider the civilian impact of their combat operations. The Every Casualty Campaign has a similar idea. They focus on filling a different gap in the laws of war, the absence of a mechanism for tracking civilian harm. Originally founded by a consortium of conflict researchers, the movement has grown to encompass a global practitioner network and 51 NGO supporters, and includes a call for governments to standardize the monitoring and measurement of civilian harms. Meanwhile, a network of many civil society organizations is urging governments to reconsider whether aerial bombing and the use of explosives in urban areas is not in fact an inherently indiscriminate method of warfare one with unacceptable impacts on civilians.
These groups are working to do more than show there is a devastating problem for civilians in terms of compliance with the law. They are working to convince governments that change in the rules themselves is necessary and possible. If they succeed, they could revolutionize the way wars are waged, requiring governments to do what just war theory has always said they should do in war. Ask soldiers, men and women alike, to take risks in order to ensure that the damage of war on civilians, men, women, and children alike, is minimized. It is a strange commentary on our times that this work should be so difficult, so revolutionary, but this, I think, is where the real task for ungendering civilian protection lies in the years ahead. Thank you.